Praise the Lord. We welcome you to our Sunday worship service today in Jesus' name. And I pray that everything will do good in your life in Jesus' name. Can I give a word of admonition before we begin? You should normally dress as if you are coming to the Sunday worship at the worship sanctuary. And also concentrate and make sure that you are fully there, completely there. You are not, uh, you know, going out to pick something, going to this and going to that. Let's have the discipline of being together as we worship together. And the Lord will bless you abundantly and tremendously in Jesus' name. Thank you. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you today and bless your name. We glorify you for this day of worship. And we're asking, O oh Lord, you give us real con the concentration and real consecration and real communion with you in Jesus' name. We pray that as the word enters, as the word penetrates our heart, we pray that your blessing will come, your healing will come, your deliverance will come, and your provision will come to every life in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that you so touch your people, you so turn around your people, that every form of captivity, every form of calamity, everything will vanish away in Jesus' name. Bless your people today, one and all. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. As already we have learned from the side scripture, we are looking at Job chapter 42. And I'm concentrating now on the memory verse. You remember the memory verse? And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Think about that. And we need to meditate on that and see the way to get into the blessing of God and the way every yoke will be broken in every life and the way every calamity and every uh, captivity will be turned around. Uh, let me uh, look at this. It says, the Lord turned the captivity of Job. As you think about um, that word captivity, it's talking about the captivity of an individual. It's not talking of the captivity of a nation, really. It's not talking about captivity of a tribe, of a group of people. One person, one person. The Lord turned the captivity of Job. As we look at uh, that word, uh, captivity, I want you to turn your mind back to Job chapter 2, reading from verse 6. In Job chapter 2, verse 6, it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but same is life. And you see there, um, Satan had been arguing about a Job. He's serving you because you made the edge around him. He's serving you because you have prospered him. He's serving you because everything is going well in his life. And so God said, That's all right. I leave him in your hand. Behold, he is in thine hand. That's the captivity when somebody comes under the load and the oppression and the wickedness and the cruelty and the calamity of Satan. When affliction comes, that affliction is regarded as captivity. But you know, the Lord limited Satan and he said, but save his life. If you look at verse 7, it says in verse 7, So when Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. That's the captivity when somebody has all the boils all over in the crown of the head, even on the side, on the face, and then in the hands, in the arms, and in the body, every part of the body covered with boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. That he is unto, unto his head. He couldn't go out. He is like an house arrest with pain, with affliction, that incarceration. That imprisonment, that house arrest, that he couldn't go out to do anything, 
That is the captivity. I was told in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, And he took him a pot shed to scrape himself with that, and he sat down among the ashes. He couldn't just, uh, you know, lie on the hard ground. He couldn't lie on a clean, uh, or on a mattress. But now he sat down upon among the ashes. Day and night he suffered. Day and night he had pain, excruciating pain. And he couldn't do anything by himself or for himself go to the farm or go here and there when sickness makes a person go down to the to the point that the person is kept down and he cannot do anything he's confined he's hedged around is uh, compelled to stay in one place in pain and affliction that is captivity if you look at isaiah chapter 49 isaiah chapter 49 from verse 24 it says shall the prey be taken from the mighty of the lawful captive, delivered captive, captivity. A person who is in captivity is a captive and is under a mighty power, under a power that you could not shake off. That's captivity. Look at verse 25. It says in verse 25, but thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty, that is the captivity. When a mighty personality, a mighty power, that you couldn't resist and couldn't shake up, when that person keeps you down, when that person pins you down, and when that person oppresses you with mighty power, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away. And the prey of the terrible, the prey of the terrible, when somebody is like helpless under a, a person who is terrible, a person who is oppressive, that's the captivity, but says, it shall be delivered, for I will contend with him that contended with thee. The contender, the person who is oppressing you with contention, with affliction, that you are helpless. That's the captivity the Lord is talking about. But he says, and I will save thy children. As we come to the New Testament, in Second Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 26. Second Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 26, it says, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. They are taken captive by him, by Satan. He takes them like slaves. He takes them to work for him. They are compelled to go with him. And they are compelled to do whatever he has said. If they don't, it will afflict them. It will punish them. It will oppress them. That's captivity. And if there is any captivity like that in any person's life today, sickness, affliction, attacks, or whatever, and the person is compelled to just stay there and see if I have, I have no choice, I have to serve this and serve that, do you know it's going to deliver you today? It will set you free because we're told, if you go back to our text that we're looking at, a memory verse, uh, Job chapter 42, reading from verse 10 there, it says, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. We're talking today to you on divine prescription for freedom, for captivity. I rejoice with you that you are here at the service today. I rejoice that you are connected today because freedom from captivity and the Lord has given us the divine prescription as he spoke to Job as if this is a problem that might never be solved a problem that will never go away but the Lord himself turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends when he prayed for his friends and also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Don't go away yet. Look at that verse. It says, And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. You know, when we read the scriptures, we need to read with understanding. And we need to compare scripture with scripture. As we look at this, chapter 42, it says, Job had 
seven sons and three daughters. If you go back to the beginning, you can do that on your own. In Job chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. You know how many sons Job had? Seven sons. You know how many daughters he had? Three daughters. Seven sons and three daughters. They were not double. He didn't give him 14 sons and six daughters. You know, when it says and the Lord gave twice as much as he had before, it's talking about material things. It's talking about the cattle. It's talking about the oxen. And it's talking about the purse. It's talking about property. He gave him twice as much as he had before. I'm going to tell you another thing. You know, in chapter 2, I'll just tell you, you don't have to open. In chapter 2 of Job, the wife said, are you still keeping your integrity? Are you still serving God? Are you still trusting God? Because God and dying. And Job said that you speak like one of the foolish women. Shall we receive good from the hand of God and not receive evil? And so Job said not with his mouth. I want to tell you something. Between that time and this time, that wife did not say anything negative anymore. And you know, when God said, I'm angry with your friends of Job, he never mentioned that he was angry with the wife because that had been settled. When you have a kind of discussion with your wife or maybe quarrel in court or disagreement in court, and then you settle it. Why are you talking like that? Why are you talking like that? You talk as if, you know, we don't have salvation. You talk as if we are not children of the kingdom of God. And we settle it there, God also settles it there. And, the, and Job did not go and get another wife. And when it says the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before, not two wives and not a double number of children, children, the same number, the Lord gave him again. Wife, the same wife and the same husband join together until death do you part. So, the Lord is not encouraging, you know, I'll get another one. He doesn't support my business. She doesn't support uh, my progress. She doesn't support my well-being. She even looks now, man, look at the way she's talking. She wants me to backslide. Settle that and carry on. You're still husband and wife. And the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. And when God turns the captivity of the wife or the captivity of the husband, you together will see me productive and then you'll have twice as much as you had before in Jesus' name. Today, as I said, I'm talking to you on divine prescription. The divine prescription for freedom from captivity. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, repentance and redemption from the captivity of sin. Sin is captivity. And then point number two, Remedy for recovery from the captivity of sickness. And today that yoke will be broken. Today that oppression will be taken away. Today that sickness will vanish away in Jesus' name. And then point number three is release and reclamation from the captivity of Satan. Look at that three things. Number one, sin. Number two, sickness. Number three, Satan. All from the captivity of sin, of sickness, and of uh, Satan, deliverance has come. And total devastation of the evil one has come in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number one now. Point number one is repentance and redemption from the captivity of sin. Repentance and redemption from the captivity of sin. We're reading from Job chapter 42, verses 5 and 6. Job chapter 42, and I'm reading from verse 5. I have heard, here is Job now confessing. I have heard, here is Job talking back to God. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. You notice something, you know, when Isaiah saw the Lord and he saw the glory of God, he saw the holiness of God, he saw the immaculate whiteness, righteousness of God, 
he depreciated himself. He saw how different he was from the Almighty. And he said, I am a man upon three leaves. And the angel came and touched his leaves and said, your sin is taken away. The same thing when you see God in his uh, majesty, when you see God in his glory, when you see God in his righteousness and holiness, you will see how far different you are from the holiness of God, from the righteousness of God. And so he said, mine eye now seeth thee. Look at verse 6. The result of that, there wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Wherefore, I abhor myself from dust and ashes. Now, when we talk about the captivity of sin, there are three things I want to point to you. Number one, the recognition of the captivity of sin. Look at Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 22. You will see that sin binds, and sin keeps keep somebody in captivity. Are you opening your Bible there in, in uh, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 22? His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holding it shall be bound, it shall be kept in captivity, in captivity with the cords of a sin. You see, we're responsible for what we do. And when somebody commits sin, when somebody goes into iniquity, number one, it's, uh, it's an act. And then later, as it goes on and goes on like that, it becomes a habit and like cords that bind him, that he cannot help himself anymore. We're told in 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive, underline that word captive, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse laws. You see that? It's telling us that when somebody is living in sin, when somebody has not been uh, forgiven, somebody has not been set free, somebody has not had the salvation of the Lord, is leading with sin and it is captivity, the captivity of sin. So we must recognize the captivity of sin. Look at Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 14. It's telling us now what captivity sin is. It says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, I am sold under sin. It's like somebody is sold like a slave unto the master, which is sin. And sin holds that person captive. In verse 15 it says, uh, It says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. And what I hate, that I do. It's like a slave, and the master is compelling him, This is what you will do. This is what you must do. It's doing it, but it's not at ease. It's doing it, but he doesn't have an easy conscience about it. It's doing it, but he doesn't like it. That's captivity. And then in verse 16, it tells us in verse 16, it says, If then I do that, I would not. I consent unto the law that it is good. The law is good. But then in verse 17, it says, now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Sin that dwelleth in me. It's like the master all the time watching over him and saying, have you done that? Have you done that? That evil sin, you must do that. You see, there are people that are compelled People that are propelled, and if they're sitting quietly at home, they will rush out. They want to go and do evil. They might cry after doing it. They might be sorry after doing it. And they might uh, know that this sin is bringing calamity on them, but they're in captivity. Look at verse 23 in uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 23. It says, But I see another member, another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity. You see that? Sinning is captivity. Transgressing is a captivity. And going into iniquity without a chance 
of repenting and turning around is captivity. It says, bringing me into captivity to the Lord of sin, which is in my members. And then he cries out in verse 24, and he says, O wretched man that I am, O wretched slave that I am, O wretched captive that I am, O wretched sinner that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Thank God, that's why we are, we are here today. The Lord will deliver everyone. As we think about this point, number one, then we come to repentance after conviction for sin. Repentance after conviction for sin. Already we have read Job chapter 42, where Job said, I repent in dust and ashes. That repentance is so important. But let me point out something to you about that repentance in Second Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're looking at verse 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 10, For godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Godly sorrow walketh repentance uh, to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world walketh death. Let me explain to you. When somebody has done something evil, and the law enforcement agents catch him, and then he's charged to court, and he has a sentence that he wasn't expecting, and he's now going to go into the prison, he's going to spend these number of years, he's deprived of staying with his wife, deprived of staying with the children, deprived of living in the community, he has sorrow, and it's the sorrow of the world. It is regret. Why did I do that? It is remorse. Why did I do that? But when somebody has genuine repentance, that genuine repentance comes out of conviction for sin. Because of that conviction for sin, he really feels sorry. Because of that conviction for sin, he really feels, I shouldn't have done that. I mustn't do that again. If God will forgive me this and give me grace to live a righteous life, an honest life, I will not come into all this again. If that conviction for sin is not there, if that conviction for the evil he has done is not there, if there's not a piercing conviction in his conscience, all they will have will be regret. All they will have will be remorse. All they will have will be empty resolution. I will not do that again. If I do that again, if you see my leg there again, cut it off. You see, all that is empty resolution. All they will have is looking for reputation. He wants to build up his reputation. He's not really sorry about what he has done. But you know, if our repentance is going to be accepted by God, if our repentance is going to work salvation, real salvation that takes us to heaven, godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world walketh dead. We're told this is required of everyone in Acts of the Apostle chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, reading from verse 30. Acts chapter 17, reading from verse 30. For the times of, of this ignorance, God went at. You see all that Job did, all that Job said, as he replied his friends, they were out of ignorance. And God said, I overlook that. And Job was so grateful to God that God will overlook all the times of ignorance. But now commanded all men everywhere to repent. All we have done in our past ignorant life, all we have done without the teaching of the scripture, all that we have done without consciousness that this is not right in the sight of God, God says, I'm willing to overlook. I sent my only begotten son to die for your sin and to take your sin away and as you come to believe and you are really sorry. I shouldn't have done that. It's my sin, it's your sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. And because of that suffering of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, I turned away from sin. I turned to my Savior and I want to live a life that is glorifying unto you. The Lord will forgive. But now he has commanded all men 
everywhere to repent. In verse 31, it tells us in verse 31, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, that's by Jesus, whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men. He's given us assurance that he will forgive everyone. He's given assurance that judgment will pass over us if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How did he give us the assurance? He gave assurance unto all men in that he has raised him up from the dead. Before we leave that point, number one, we're looking at the third part. Number one, uh, part one is recognizing the captivity of sin. Part two is repentance after conviction for sin. And number three, there is redemption and cleansing from all sins. Redemption and cleansing from all sin. You know what God does? He redeems us. He takes all the power of sin away and he takes the punishment of sin away. In Romans chapter 3, reading from verse 24. In Romans chapter 3, verse 24, it says, Being justified freely, you don't pay anything. You know? Salvation is more costly than money. Salvation cannot be bought with money. Salvation is by the grace of God. It's available for you. It's available for me. It's available for every member of your family. It's available for everyone being justified freely by His grace. Remember that all the time. By His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25 says, From whom God has set forth, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. He shed his blood for you. And that blood is for the cleansing of your sin. He shed his blood for you. And that blood is to take your sin away and to cleanse all your sins. And you have faith in that blood. You have faith in that propitiation. You have faith in that sacrifice of Christ to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Verse 26 tells us to declare, I say, at this time is righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The justifier of him who believes in Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1, he talks about this redemption again. But you know, it's done something. We need to think about this. Have you opened that in your Bible? Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness? Remember, the personality behind the suffering of Job as Satan, the personality behind the suffering and the affliction of Job is the power of darkness. In that forgiveness, in that redemption, as the Lord brings you to himself and he claims you as his own son, as his own daughter, as his own child, he delivers you from the power of darkness and he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. How did that happen? Look at verse 14. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The redemption we have through his blood also took us away from the hand of the evil one. Even the forgiveness of sins. Even the forgiveness of sins. All sins all together. He bundles everything together and he redeems us. That's our redemption in Titus chapter in Titus chapter two, reading from verse fourteen. Titus chapter two, verse fourteen. Who gave himself for us? You can put yourself there. Who gave himself for you? Who gave himself for me? Who gave himself for us? Every one of us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous. Of good works. Redemption is available. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be forgiven, shall be, re shall be redeemed, shall be ransomed, shall be taken away from the captivity of sin. Let's come to point number two now. Point number two is uh, talking about the remedy for recovery from the captivity of sickness. Remedy for recovery 
from the captivity of sickness. That brings us back to Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42, I'm reading from verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. When he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. The Lord turned the captivity of Job. We've talked about the captivity of sin. Now we're talking about the captivity of sickness. The captivity of sickness. Because what did he have? He had sickness. Because of the sickness, he had sorrow. Because of that, he had suffering and all the accusations of his friends uh, against him that just uh, bogged him down. In fact, he, he was wishing he would even die. He said, why was I born? The pain was too much. Whatever your pain is, my sister, whatever your pain is, my brother, deliverance is coming to you. And assurance of your recovery, the remedy for your recovery from uh, the captivity of sickness, it will happen in Jesus' name. But you know, my brother, sister, we need to enlighten ourselves. And we need to understand the way of the Lord. There are people that think if we're going to be uh, free from sickness, the only thing we do, we pray and pray and pray and pray. And we pray for ourselves. And if prayer has not done it, we go into fasting, dry fasting, many days fasting. I have not fasted enough. If I had fasted enough for my wife, she would have been healed. If I had fasted enough for myself, I would have been healed. We think that the only way we can have the healing and total recovery from the, uh, from the captivity of sickness is only through uh, praying and fasting. Praying is good. Don't misunderstand me. Fasting is good. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just telling you that from the scriptures. That is just a few of the things we can do to have our healing. Number one, let me talk about the remedy of compassion. The remedy of compassion. Despite sorrows, despite the sorrows that he had to have compassion upon his friends. Look at that verse 10 again. It says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. And the Lord reversed the captivity of Job. And the Lord took away the sickness of Job when he prayed for his friends. When he prayed for his friends. And you see that. That's compassion for his friends. They criticized him. They slandered him. They suspected him. They condemned him. They were like enemies. They were like foes. They were like slanderers. But he had compassion on them. God said, Eliphaz, I'm angry with you. God said, I'm angry with your two friends too. I'm angry with the three of you because you have not said the right thing about me like Job, my servant, has said. Job could have said, that's right, that's right, condemn them. That's right, judge them. That's right, let your affliction come upon them. Look at what he said about me, but no, but no. He had compassion upon his friends. Do you know, my brother, my sister, when you have compassion, Upon the people that have slandered you. Upon the people that have offended you. That compassion that you have upon those people can bring healing to you. Can bring uh, relief for, for, for sickness, uh, from suffering from your sickness. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 44. In Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 44, but I say unto you, Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Isn't that what Job did? You love them. You have compassion on them. You love them. You pray for them. You love them. You intercede for them. You love them. You wish the best for them. You know, if you're sick, if you have affliction, if you have whatever it is uh, that is uh, oppressing your life, and you want to be free, you cannot have all. Hateful thoughts in that condition. You cannot harbor a kind of oppressive action, even in that. If you are sick and you are totally down, the people that you have had a kind of interaction with before and a kind of altercation, a kind of argument with, you cannot keep on being angry at them because that will delay your healing. 
but you love your enemies. You bless them that cause you. And you do good to them that hate you. Can I tell you according to the word of God, when you're sick, when you are down, instead of just praying and praying, it's good to pray. Instead of fasting and fasting, sometimes it's good to fast if your body health and your stamina can take it. But sometimes all you have to do is to recollect the people who offended you and the people you have decided, I'm going to do this to them, I'm going to do that for them. I must pay them back in their own coin. If you will just turn around and bless them that cause you. You know healing can come that way. Health can come up that way. And do good to them that hate you. Do good to them that hate you. Look at this. Look at what Job did. And pray for them which despisefully use you and persecute you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What does that mean? Look at verse 45. Look at what God will look at. It says that ye may be the children of your father. That you may resemble God the father who is loving, who is benevolent, who is helpful. And who brings people out of condemnation. That you will have the same nature as your father. And if you do that, your health will come. If you do that, you will have quick recovery. And then it says, For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. How can we have healing? How can we have recovery? How can we have a turning around of any calamity and reverse all those things? What we do? Number one, we must have compassion, despite the sorrows we are going through. Number two, the recovery from captivity of sickness. The recovery from the captivity of sickness. You will recover. You must recover. You will not die in that condition. Members of your family, you are concerned about, you are concerned about that wife, you are concerned about that child. They will not die in that condition. But you know, we have a responsibility as we are going to recover, as you are going to recover from the captivity of sickness. Look at Psalm 41. Psalm 41, we're reading from verse 1. Psalm 41, reading from verse 1. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. You know, uh, our attitude, I'm talking about the majority of people. I have trouble, I have trial, I have difficulty, and then there's somebody to help. He's poorer than we are. There's somebody to visit. He's sick, he's more sick than we are. We we'll say, how can I do that? I have my own problem. I have my own load. I have my own challenges. I have my own difficulties. But you know the word of God? If we're going to recover, it's not every time, you know, pray, pray, pray. Prayer is good. But you know, sometimes if we have prayer and stinginess, if we have prayer and selfishness, if we have prayer and self-centeredness, it delays the answer to our prayer. But blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. No matter what is going on. No matter what you are going through. The Lord will preserve you. Say amen. And the Lord will keep you alive. Another amen. Look at this. And he shall be blessed upon the earth. Upon this, Job was blessed when he remembered his friends and when he had compassion on them and when he prayed for them when he wasn't drowned in his sorrows, when he wasn't drowned in his sickness, when he wasn't drowned in his suffering. You see, the Lord said, Pray for your friends and pray for those people that slandered you and he didn't argue. Lord, they have left an indelible mark in my heart. The pain is so much. I cannot do anything like that for them. No. The secret 
of we coming out of a calamity of sickness is to pray for them, pray for others. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive and he shall be blessed upon the earth. Look at this. And thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. Verse 3 is very, is very instructive. In verse 3, the Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. And thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. In his sickness, if he remembers the poor. In his sickness, if he, if he prays for those who offended him. The Lord said, he will have mercy on him. The Lord said he will have compassion on him and that sickness will be healed. The Lord is still available today. The Lord is still going about today. He will heal you. Even this very day, he will take the calamity of sickness away from you and from your family in Jesus' name. Look at Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. I will read him from verse 38. Acts chapter 10, reading from verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about, is still going about, is still going about, he'll come to your house right there. He'll come to your fellowship right there. He'll come to the sanctuary right there and he will spot you out. And he will identify you there. And whatever you are going through today is a day of recovery for you in Jesus' name. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about doing good, went about doing good and healing all. How many people and healing all? I said, how many people do you see there and healing all? And you are part of that all. Your day of recovery has come. The remedy has now come. Your deliverance has now come. And it says, and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. In James uh, chapter 5, James chapter 5, uh, we are reading from verse 13, Is any sick among you? Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. And then in verse 14, in verse 14 it says, Is any sick among you? And it doesn't matter the kind of sickness. And it doesn't matter who is the any among us. A new convert is just come. And a new believer, yeah, do anyone seek among you a new child or maybe a son, a daughter? Is anyone seek among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him call for the elders of the church. You see something there? It doesn't, it doesn't um, tell us the category of that elder, whether that elder is a very senior apostle whether that elder is a newly appointed uh, pastor, whether that elder is a, is a new leader, any elder, any elder, all that God is waiting for is to obedient to what he's telling us. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15 says, it tells us, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Whoever is praying that prayer of faith, a pastor, a group pastor, an overseer, region overseer, a state overseer, national overseer, anyone, anyone of us that will pray that prayer of faith, that will know that God is faithful. God cannot lie. And God said, if you call me the elder, and then I shall pray for them. And because we are obeying the Lord, it says the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up if he has committed sins. Look at that. Look at the assurance. They shall be forgiven him if he has committed sins. And he doesn't, he doesn't tell us the category of sin, the size of the sin, the long-standing or habitual sin, besetting sin, whatever sin. If he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Verse 16 is very important. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Confession brings skill. 
confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that he may be a confidence bring care on we're confident we have done what the Lord has said. We have called the elder and he has prayed for us. It may be that he prays on the phone. It may be that he prays uh, by sending a text. I prayed for you, rest assured, everything is over. By any means he has prayed for us. He might have personal contact with us and pray for us. When we have that confidence, it will bring kill. And then consecration brings kill. We now get up and we're about our business. We're not saying, I will not serve God until I'm healed. I'll not evangelize until I'm healed. While this reproach is still there, how can I be going about and serving God? Confession brings skill. Confidence brings skill. And consecration brings skill. You shall serve the Lord your God. And he will bless your bread and bless your water. And then look at it. I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Keep on serving the Lord consecrated unto the Lord. Your cure has come already. Look at that verse 16, latter part. The, effect, the effectual pardon prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual pardon prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What's pardon prayer? Some people think, uh, if I knock my head on the wall, if I cry, if I shout, if I jump, if I hurt myself, that's pardon prayer. It's, not, it's talking about the prayer from the heart. It says, the prayer that comes from the heart on the basis of the scripture. The prayer that comes fervently looking at the cross, the one who died for everyone. The prayer that comes and you are intimately looking at the stripes of Jesus Christ and you're holding on to that fervently. And you are holding on to the stripes of Christ permanently with the whole of your heart, with all the passion of your heart. That prayer will not be denied. It's not talking about crying and screaming and all that. I will say, what are you doing? I'm offering fervent prayer. If it's coming from the head, if it's just coming from your voice, that's not fervent. That is superficial. But the one that comes from your heart, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That prayer will avail in your life today. We're talking about the remedy of compassion despite sorrows. We're talking about the recovery from captivity of sickness. We're talking about the reversal of calamity for his servant. The reversal of calamity for his servant. You know, if you come back to Job chapter 42, Job chapter 42, you will see what the Lord said about Job. He said, it's my servant. And he said, now, the Lord turned the captivity of Job. That what turned, the Lord reversed the captivity of Job. Your captivity will be reversed today. Your yoke will be broken today. And all the calamity upon yourself, or upon your family, upon your work, upon your profession, every negative thing will be reversed today in Jesus' name. And all the reproach, the said days and the said days, the Lord reversed everything. The people had opposed him and they had criticized him. And God said, that's my beloved servant. He reversed all that reproach. Every negative thing against your life. Life, as a child of God, as a servant of God, will be reversed today in Jesus' name. If you say, Amen, it is done. And the Lord turned and the Lord reversed the, the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, he gave him, he gave Job twice as much as he had before. He reversed the poverty. He reversed, he reversed the laws. Everything you have lost, the Lord will give back to you today in Jesus' name. You are going to sing for joy. And you are going to be happy because of the reversal of the calamity that came to your life. Look at Psalm 126, and I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 126, we're reading from verse 1. The Lord turned the captivity of Job. When the Lord, again, when the Lord turns, again, 
the captivity of Zion, when one like them that dream. And in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, Then was our mouth filled with laughter. Your time has come. Your mouth will be filled with laughter. And your heart will be filled with joy. And our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord has done great things for them. Your neighbors will observe. And your friends will observe. And your co-workers will observe. The Lord has done great things for you. This is going to be a happy Sunday. This is going to be a joyful day for you. Look at verse 3 there. It says in verse 3, The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for us. Whereof we are glad. Make it personal. The Lord has done great things for me. Say that. The Lord has done great things for me. Whereof I am glad. You are glad and your joy will not be taken away from you in Jesus' name. By the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. By the stripes of Jesus, your calamities are reversed. By the stripes of Jesus, all your problems, all those things that came upon you, like affliction, everything is gone in Jesus' name. Point number one. Point number one is talking about repentance and redemption from the captivity of sin. Point number two, the remedy for recovery from the captivity of sickness. Now, point number three, release and reclamation. Release and reclamation from the captivity of Satan. Release and reclamation from the captivity of of Satan. We're coming back here to Job chapter 42 and we're reading from verse 10. Job chapter 42, reading from verse 10. It says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. How many times have we read that now? That should sink deep into your heart and you put your name there in the place of Job because Job has served the Lord and he has gone. He is in heaven now. You are the man of the hour. You are the woman of the hour. And it is because of you the Lord has reserved this for us. All things whatsoever that were reaching a portent. They were reaching for our learning that we through the comfort and patience of scriptures might have hope. Now it is you. The Lord will turn your captivity as you pray for your friends and as you do the will of God. And then the Lord gave Job and the Lord is giving you twice as much as you had before. And there are three things we're looking at here. Number one is the release from the captivity of Satan. Release from the captivity of Satan. Number two is reckoning the curse on Satan. That is, a curse came on Satan. You reckon that and you count it done. And you don't reckon that you are the one going to bear the cross. He is bearing the, uh, the cross. And then there's rejoicing over the conquering of Satan. Today is the day you will rejoice as you see Satan conquered in Jesus' name. Let's come to number one. is the release from the captivity of Satan. We're looking at Luke chapter 13 and we're looking at verse 11. Luke chapter 13, reading from verse 11. It says, And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity eighteen years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. This woman had been bound together. That's captivity. That's captivity. She was bound and she bowed down without being able to lift up herself. And in verse 12, a glorious day came. And when Jesus saw her, your glorious day comes. When Jesus sees you and when Jesus beholds you, Praise the Lord. I rejoice with you. The Lord has seen you today. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And once Jesus says it, it is done. And the Lord from glory and the Lord from the siege of authority is talking to you now, man, Woman, boy, girl, thou art loose from thine infirmity. It says in verse 13, in verse 13, and he laid his hands on her, 
and immediately help me shout immediately over there immediately when will your yoke be broken when will your calamity be taken away and when will your uh, captivity to satan or any power when will it be broken that's right that's right immediately immediately she was made straight and glorified god you glorify god today you glorify god today look at verse 16 there in verse 16 it says and ought not this woman being a daughter of abraham whom satan as bound captivity of satan whom satan has bound bondage of satan whom satan has bound lo these 18 years be loose from this bond on the sabbath day be loose from this bond on the sabbath day look at luke chapter 4 in luke chapter 4 reading from verse 18 Luke chapter 4, reading from verse 18. The, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. There's the Lord Jesus Christ announcing that, proclaiming that. There's the Lord Jesus Christ reminding us of what had been written concerning him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives, to proclaim deliverance to the captives and to minister, to manifest deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. And then in verse 19, it says in verse 19, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the day acceptable to the Lord, the month and the year acceptable to the Lord, and the day and the month and the year that all your calamity and all your captivity were broken and rolled away in Jesus' name. Verse 20, in verse 20, it says, and he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and he sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fasting on him. Look unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. Fasting your eyes on him, your attention on him. And then in verse 21, here is going to be the result. And he began to say unto them, and he begins to say unto you, and he's saying unto us today, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears in your life it will be fulfilled on your family it will be fulfilled total complete deliverance and release from the captivity of satan look at verse 36 in verse 36 it says and they were all amazed and they spake among themselves saying what a word is this for with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits and they come out. And they come out. Those last two words in that verse, come out. Say that, come out. Say that again, come out. Look at the person by your side there in your family and the person that might have any challenge and look at Christ living in you and Christ saying through you, come out. They come out in Jesus' name. Now, how does that happen? In your heart, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about the curse on Satan. The curse on Satan. The curse is not on you now. Christ has taken your curse away. And as he took your curse away, the curse on Satan became activated and became fulfilled. It's in Genesis chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 14. Genesis chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, the Lord God said unto Satan, the Lord God said to the devil, the Lord God said unto Satan, that actually used, a Satan that used the serpent. He said, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. 
You will not eat my son. You will not eat my daughter. You will not eat a citizen of the kingdom. Does are you going to eat all the days of your life? Verse 15. In verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman. I put enmity between Satan and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. The seed of the woman will bruise the head of Satan, and that shall bruise his seal. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, that's Satan bruising him at his heel, in his heel. But at the same time, the curse came upon Satan. And Jesus bruised him on his head. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And I've been spoiled principalities and powers. You remember what the word of God says? We're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but we're wrestling against principalities and powers. And now Christ has spoiled, has defeated has uh, clubbed the head of the principalities and the powers and has made a show of them openly, triumphing over them, triumphing over the principalities and the powers in age that is on the cross. What's the result now? Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers, of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him. Through his death on the cross of Calvary, through his death, a substitutionary death, through his death that he died for you, that through his death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that he is the devil, he has destroyed his power. In your life, he has destroyed his power. In your family, he has destroyed his power. In your ministry, he has destroyed his power. In your profession, he has destroyed his power. That he might destroy him that had the power of death. That he is the devil. Look at verse 15 there. In verse 15 it says, and deliver them, all of them and deliver them, everyone with that exception, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. They are set you free. You are free in Jesus' name. Look at First John chapter 3 verse 8. First John chapter 3 verse 8. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sin from the beginning. The people who do not know that Satan is already defeated, Satan is destroyed, and as a curse upon a Satan, they say following after him, they say yoke to him, they say link to him. The people who do not know that they, they, the chain is broken, and you don't have to be a servant anymore. Those who are ignorant of that, they are the people who are still linked unto the devil. But look at the second part there. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Thank God the works of the devil all over destroyed in any part of your life in Jesus' name. Number one is the release from the captivity of Satan. You are released in Jesus' name. Number two is reckoning the curse on Satan. He is cursed and you are free from the curse. Number three now is rejoicing over the conquering of Satan. Satan is conquered. Say that Satan is conquered. You will rejoice over that conquering of Satan in Jesus' name. Look at Luke chapter 10 verse 17. The 17 returned again with joy 
Are you going out for evangelism today? You will return home with joy. Are you visiting the sick today? You will return home with joy. Are you touching somebody's life today? As the Lord has said, go out and go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Are you doing good in anybody's life today? You are having victory as you go out. You are having converts as you go out. You are seeing the sick healed as you go out. And you yourself, as you are going out and ministry to the sick, you are going to be strong as you come back. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Look at verse 18. And he said unto them, and he saying unto you, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Satan is falling. He'll fall away from your family. Satan is falling. He'll fall away from anyone, everyone of your loved ones in Jesus' name. And now verse 19, this is mine. I said, this is mine. I said, this is yours. In Jesus' name, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Can you say this after me? Behold, he gives unto me power. Behold, he gives unto me power. To tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Are you saying it? He has given you power over all the power of every enemy. And now, and nothing shall by any means hurt me. Say that. And nothing shall by any means hurt me. As you go out, nothing will hurt you. As you come back, nothing will hurt you. You will not uh, contract any of the things the people are contracting. You remain safe. You remain healthy. You remain sound. You remain protected in Jesus' name. Look at verse 20 there. In verse 20 it says, Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice, rather rejoice, rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. I want to give you a key before you, before you go uh, out of the service today. I want to give you a key. You'll find that in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Uh, look at your key in verse 20. Romans chapter 16. Uh, and we're reading from verse 20. The God of peace shall put Satan under your feet shortly. We're going to rise up. We're going to pray. And as you stand up, you are standing on top of your problem. You are standing on top of your calamity. You are standing away from the captivity. The cage is open. The prison is open. And you are standing on top of the problem. And the God of peace shall boost Satan under your feet shortly. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Did you hear that? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Say amen. The power of the Lord Jesus be with you. The presence of the Lord Jesus be upon you. And the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you. Amen. I say amen for your life in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and now talk to the Lord and rejoice and rejoice before the Lord because now he has given us the divine prescription for freedom from calamity. He has given us the prescription for freedom from calamity. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, open your mouth and tell the Lord your victory has come, your release has come. If there is any sin there, you repent. If there's anything your heart says, or maybe something uh, you know comes up in your heart, just hand it over to the Lord. Have the conviction for that sin and for that transgression and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm meaning from the depth of your heart. And then uh, redemption comes from all captivity. And there is a remedy for recovery. Remedy. As you, you know, pray for your friends, as you have compassion on the people who have hurt you, as you forgive totally from the depth of your heart, redemption will come for you. 
sickness will be taken away completely from your life and then release release it releases you today from the power of the enemy and you stand on your problems because you will have the victory all the days of your life the god of peace the god of mercy the god of love the god of power bruce satan under your feet from now and henceforth in Jesus name and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ the goodness of our Lord Jesus Christ the power of our Lord Jesus Christ the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and forevermore amen let's pray together father we well, thank you today. We we'll bless your name. Thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, because it's the day of joy. It's the day of gladness. And it's the day of victory for everyone. I'm asking, O oh Lord, that your strength, your might, your power, the recovery and the cure will come upon everyone in Jesus' name. Every sin confessed, every sin repented of, forgive your people totally and completely, and let your spirit bear witness in their hearts. They are totally forgiven in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray, captivity of sin, broken. Captivity of sickness, broken. Captivity of Satan, broken. Set your people free and give them total redemption. Set your people free and give them total release and recovery. Set your people free and give them total release and reclamation in Jesus' name. And get help them to remain free. Because if the Son shall make us free, we shall be free indeed, Lord According to your word, I proclaim your freedom to all your people. I proclaim the release to all your people. And I proclaim the healing and the recovery to everyone in Jesus' name. As we go out to evangelize, as we go out to witness, as we go out to touch the lives of other people, we'll bring them into the kingdom of God and great will be a victory and great will be a rejoicing. We go out with the seed of the word and we'll come back home rejoicing in Jesus' name. Let your deliverance, let your redemption, let your healing, let your salvation, let your joy, let the victory be confirmed in every life right now. Thank you, Lord, because I know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord has blessed you. Continue to rejoice in the deliverance of the Lord. Remember, you are going out and you are touching other lives. And as you touch their lives, blessings will come to them and blessings will be multiplied in your life too. Thank you and God bless you.